Well, we're at just about 200. So I'm going to go ahead and get things started. I'm Elizabeth Gage. I'm the office and volunteer coordinator in typically in the office, currently working remotely. And I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. Um, I have a few housekeeping things. Um, one is that this presentation will be recorded and the recording will be available on our uh, website. And I'm putting the actual URL up here on my screen. Um, but if you go to our homepage, WNPS.org, and scroll about three banners down, you'll see a, a banner that says virtual presentations or virtual events. And you can click there. And this one will be at the top as long as it's the latest. But they go back all the way to April when we started doing this. And there's some real richness of content there. So I welcome you to check out not only this presentation, but all of our wonderful library of previous presentations. The other housekeeping thing I wanted to cover was questions and answers. I encourage you to put questions in the chat box and the Q&A and or the q and I'll try to monitor both. And I try to note them, group them if there's questions that are similar because with a group this size, we could have a, a bunch of questions and then we'll answer questions at the end of the presentation. So I will be keeping my eye on the chat box and the Q&A and um, making note of the questions. And then um, I'm gonna share my screen again and put up our beautiful calendar. Um, which is still for sale on the website. Um, and I'm gonna, on that note, I'm gonna hand things over to Yanka Hobbs, who's the current chair of our chapter. And of course, we also welcome people from chapters all around the state, but this presentation is hosted by the Central Puget Sound chapter. So take it away, Yanka. Hello everybody, Happy New Year on behalf of the Central Puget Sound chapter and of, of WNPS and welcome to our first presentation of 2021. Um, as Elizabeth said, we are, um, calendars are still available for this year and since there haven't been um, opportunities to um, for chapters to sell calendars in person. If you are a WNPS member affiliated with a chapter, $3 of the sale price will go to your chapter. So think of people that you forgot to get something for the holidays for and get them a calendar. Or if you haven't got one for, your, for yourself yet, they are, they are absolutely beautiful. Um, the, I guess, chapter, chapter business, the um, biggest new um, development is what I'd like to welcome um, Mary Nakasoni, who has volunteered to um, coordinate the um, spring plant sale, which is tentatively scheduled for the weekend of um, Mother's Day. And this will be done, um, this will be a no contact plant sale. Um, we will be taking orders online and um, when you order your plants, schedule, um, schedule a pickup time. Um, we, are we are tentatively planning to have it, to have the pickups at uh, Magnuson Park, but that is not, but that is not finalized yet. Um, so, Stay tuned and um, if you would like to um, be involved or have um, input, um, please contact me or, or Elizabeth Gage at the office. Um, with that, happy, happy new year, welcome, and I'll pass it on to 
Shelly, who is part of our um, wonderful um, presentations team. Shelly will. Thank you, Yanka. Bela. <laughs> uh, tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Fela Schwartz. Many of you will already know Fela as a valued member of WNPS. Having grown up in San Francisco and attending summer camp in the Sierra Nevada mountains, Fela was always interested in the natural world. As an outgrowth of those interests, she completed a master's degree on mycorrhizal interactions at Eastern Washington University in 1985. She further pursued her education by completing a PhD on the taxonomy of death camas at the University of Washington in 1994. Uh, Fela taught biology and botany at Everett Community College for 25 years before retiring. After retiring, she moved to Port Townsend, where she has lived since 2017. She currently serves as chapter chair of the Olympic Peninsula chapter of WNPS, and she has been, been a member of the Washington Native Plant Society State Board since 1994. I know that all of you join me in giving Fela a warm welcome. Thanks, Fela. Thank you, Shelley and Yanka and Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you won't see me, you'll see the slides. Yeah. Um, so welcome to everybody. I know there are a number of people that I know out there and uh, if I didn't mention your name earlier, I'm glad that you're here. Um, I did give this presentation last year in Port Townsend to the Olympic Peninsula chapter in one of our evening programs, but um, of course we're limited to how many people we can get there, even not during the pandemic because uh, we're kind of remote from places like Seattle. So I'm pleased to be able to do this again, and always it's better the second time because I know what I messed up on the first time. So um, here we go with the uh, ethnobotany around the world. Um, and uh, I will say that the reason that I know anything about this subject at all is because I taught at Everett Community College. I taught a plant ID class and a general botany class and general biology class. And um, over the years, I became friendly with the anthropology instructor there and she said, you have to teach ethnobotany. And I said, I don't know anything about ethnobotany, but uh, she convinced me that I could learn something about ethnobotany. So I began a learning journey for myself that involved um, searches on the internet, but also as I traveled to different places when I was lucky enough to do some traveling, um, I made sure that I, I found out about how people and plants interacted in those places. And so right even on this screen, you can see a picture of a shaman in Ecuador on the left, um, a woman weaving uh, pandanus baskets in Hawaii on the top right. And then these are some uh, taro roots on the bottom right that I believe I took that picture in Fiji. So I was lucky to go to a few different places. Now I have to figure out how to advance the screen. There we go. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do is kind of give you a little bit of a whirlwind tour through the subject of ethnobotany and a few examples and try to stay within my hour. Ethnobotany, the relationship between people and plants, how people use plants, especially in indigenous cultures. Um, and you could certainly focus ethnobotany in different ways. There are, when I started looking at putting a class together, I researched who was teaching ethnobotany and what were their classes. And some classes are only about medicinal uses of plants and some classes are only about a particular region like Hawaii at University of Hawaii, they have Hawaiian ethnobotany. Um, and I, of course, tried to take it all in and try to get as many uses of plants as I could and as many places and indigenous peoples 
as I could. And at the college, we um, actually made this into a diversity class. And in order to be a diversity class, it had to have a certain percentage of the class content about different cultures, different human cultures. So I had to have the botany in there, but I also got the anthropology in. Uh, here's some pictures of a few different kinds of uses of plants. And you see coconut um, husk being used for fibers and rope that was taken in Hawaii. The one, the picture below that shows the noni fruit, which is a fruit, um, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, that is commonly used in Hawaii for medicinal and tonic purposes. And on the right, you see a woman in Ecuador at a farmer's market sitting there selling crops that she's grown. So this sign was at a park, I believe on Oahu in Hawaii. And it, it kind of um, cap encapsulates the history, the human history of Hawaii. Hawaiian islands are relatively new geologically. And of course, there were no people on those islands being 2000 miles from anywhere else in the world that had people. Uh, but 1500 or so years ago, people arrived at Hawaii and they came from other Polynesian islands and they didn't know where they were going or where they would get to or how long it would take or how long they would stay. So they really had to bring everything with them that they were gonna need in this new environment. And uh, many of those things were plants. They also brought some animals, but uh, plants, as you can see on the sign says, an estimated 26 species of plants were brought. And these are commonly called the canoe plants. And these are plants um, that they use for food like banana and coconut and taro and sweet potato and breadfruit. Plants that they use for spices and medicines like noni that I just showed you, turmeric, white ginger, hibiscus, sugarcane, and kava. And plants that were used for materials such as the candle nut tree being used actually as candles. The fruit was used for that, bamboo for a building material, and the tea plant, which if you've been in Hawaii, you've seen um, the old uh, Hawaiian hula skirts made of, of tea leaves, but used for other things also. So uh, now we're not just in Hawaii on these pictures, but here are some, some examples of ethnobotanical uses of plants. Food, of course, there's uh, beets and carrots here in a farmer's market, there's rice and there's breadfruit. Um, people have had a relationship with plants in agriculture and foraging for thousands of years. And that's been in many places in the world. Here's a cabbage that um, was originally cultivated in Europe probably two to 3,000 years ago. Below it is taro, a plant that is cultivated in many tropical areas in the world. And I think everybody in Washington and in the Native Plant Society is probably familiar with this plant on the right. That's the camas plant. And these are the bulbs that um, Native Americans harvested from this plant before it flowers. And in fact, it wasn't exactly agriculture, but it was, it was um, uh, foraging that was helped along by burning the fields periodically to keep larger shrubs and trees from growing in there and shading out or crowding out the camas. And Native Americans knew exactly where those camas fields were and they would come back to them each year. Plants have been used for spices and herbs and flavorings, which we just think of today as, as flavor, but that was also important in preserving foods before refrigeration and other preservation methods were available. So here we have rosemary from Southern Europe, the Mediterranean area. On the top, we have star anise from China. And um, this picture in the middle is tamarind. I believe I took this in Central America. So it's, it's common in many tropical areas. You find it in Indian food and in um, Southeast Asian food also. 
plants can be used as stimulants and relaxants. So uh, here's a plant that everybody in the, certainly in Western Washington, my guess is everywhere in Washington, if not the world right now, uh, knows quite well, and that's coffee. I took that picture in uh, Costa Rica. Uh, here's a plant that you may be familiar with, um, cannabis. Cannabis is originally from China and, and it was originally used not only for a relaxant, its relaxant properties, but also to make a rope out of the hemp, the fibers in the hemp stems. And on the right, you see coca. Coca is the source of, one of the sources of cocaine. It is the source of cocaine, but it's used commonly as a tea in South America, in the Andes. And this, I didn't take this picture, but a colleague of mine at the college went to Peru and took that picture of coca tea. Um, medicine, we'll talk about food and medicine pretty soon. Ginkgo biloba from China, uh, ginger from uh, actually a number of tropical places. And the picture on the right was a picture I took of in Ecuador in the Amazon jungle. Um, and this woman here is a shaman and a med uh, midwife. And she and the woman on her right, or on her left, I guess, on our right, uh, were making poultices for um, some people that had uh, infected insect bites on their toes. And they just pulled some plants out of the area. We, this was a field school for pre-med students in Ecuador, in the Amazon. Uh, here's some plants that are used for tools and utensils. A picture that I believe I should credit to Heidi Bowen of the Central Puget Sound chapter. I couldn't find it again, and I think I took it from a website a couple of years ago. This is a cattail mat made by traditional people, native peoples in the Pacific Northwest. Below it is a, a dish from Hawaii called Lau Lau, um, where some food is wrapped in tea leaves, not T-E-A, but T-I leaves, and then steamed. Uh, the middle picture I took at study weekend last year, the last study weekend we had in Anacortes, and we had a Native American woman from that area showing a cedar bark basket. And finally, bamboo, which is um, a common building material in places, tropical places that don't have trees. Uh, clothing, another use of plants. Tapa bark from Hawaii, uh, cedar bark hats, from the Pacific Northwest. These uh, little skirt-like garments in New Zealand come from a plant called the New Zealand flax or the Maori flax uh, plant. And finally, cotton, which is native not only to our Southwest area, but also to Egypt. Ceremonial uses of plants. Uh, on the top left, you see a smudge, um, which are basically sagebrush leaves and other sweet smelling leaves that are burned for the smoke to, um, to bless a new dwelling place or other, other uh, ceremonial reasons by Native Americans. Uh, below that, um, something from my particular family tradition, this is, uh, these are plants used to celebrate a harvest holiday in the Jewish tra tradition called Sukkot. And these are, um, it's called the lulav and the etrog. Uh, it's made of the date palm, myrtle, willow, and this lemon-like fruit is a citron. And finally, these two pictures are the Western red cedar of extreme spiritual importance in um, Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest. So uh, before we get into some more specific examples of ethnobotany, I wanted to say something about a few teachers, a few mentors, not necessarily of mine, um, but people that made the field of ethnobotany happen. And one of them in the Pacific Northwest was Erna Gunther. She um, taught at the University of Washington. She was a student of Franz Boas, who was an anthropologist who you may have 
may recognize his name because he was also uh, the teacher of Margaret Mead. Um, and she and Erna Gunther uh, was, became an expert in Pacific Northwest Native American ethnobotany. And I'm gonna show you a picture in a couple of minutes of someone who is currently alive, who is taking on some of uh, the same interests as Erna Gunther had. This man, uh, Richard Evans Schultes, was probably the most important ethnobotanist or uh, um, progenitor of the ethnobotany field in the United States and maybe in the world. He um, was a student at Harvard, um, oh, it must have been in the 1920s, 1930s. He was born in 1915. Um, and he went there to study medicine, but he took a botany class from a fellow named Oakes Ames and uh, fell in love with botany, but he was especially interested in hallucinogenic plants. Uh, so he first studied peyote in Mexico and Oklahoma um, and, and that area of the American Southwest. Uh, and then he took a trip to the Amazon, and this was right around the beginning of World War II, late 30s, early 40s. Um, and I will show you in the next slide how you can find out more about Richard Evans Schultes. But uh, he spent quite a few years working in the Amazon. And as you can see in the picture on the left, he got became familiar with people in native tribes who in those days had very minimal contact with European and European American um, explorers. And he cataloged plants. And since he did have a high interest in um, hallucinogenic plants, he, he learned a lot, especially about a plant called ayahuasca. And you'll see more about ayahuasca in a few slides from now. So Schultes, uh, and another thing that Schultes did was during World War II, he had a contract with the US government to find a source of rubber in South America because the um, rubber that the US um, Army and Air Force was using for tires and trucks and planes and things like that was mostly coming from the Philippines and Southeast Asia and those areas were occupied by Japan. So the government, got a little upset or a little worried that they weren't gonna have enough rubber source. And they connected to uh, Dr. Schultes and he tramped through amazingly um, remote places, got malaria and all kinds of diseases. And, and I can't even explain all the things that happened to him to find these rubber plants that in the end the government did not use because they found another source for them. Um, but he went back eventually to Harvard and he taught at Harvard and he had some students who became the next generation of ethnobotanists. And these are all people my age. So, you know, they're not, not that old. Um, this is one of them, Wade Davis. Wade Davis is now an anthropologist um, working for the National Geographic Society, uh, but he started out as a student of Schultes and he wrote this book on the right, One River. And One River is a book that tells the story of Richard Evans Schultes and also tells the story of Wade Davis and another student of Schultes named Tim Plowman who went to the Amazon themselves in the 1970s and also studied hallucinogenic plants, but also cataloged many, many uh, plants used by the native peoples in the Amazon. So highly recommend that book. Uh, another student of Schultes is this man on the right, Paul Allen Cox. And Paul Allen Cox wrote, um, a book that I started out using as a um, textbook for an ethnobot for my first couple of times I taught the ethnobotany class, and then it went out of print. It's called Plants, People, and Culture. It was originally published in 1996, 
And apparently there was a second edition in 2001, but I don't think it's in print anymore. Um, anyway, he went on to uh, found, he taught at Brigham Young University in Utah for quite a while. And then he left and opened a company called Brain Chemistry Labs in Jackson, Wyoming. And he is currently using uh, plant sources uh, to develop treatments for ALS, and we'll, uh, which is Lou Gehrig's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and there is a film about him, it's called The Toxic Puzzle. I saw this film at the last Port Townsend Film Festival that happened in person, so that would have been uh, 2019. And it, I knew uh, Dr. Cox's name and was quite amazed to see this film about him. Um, Another teacher that is really important and still doing a lot of great work is Nancy Turner. She is a professor at University of Victoria and she has written a number of books about coastal first peoples, um, Canadian, the Canadian version of Native Americans, of course, is first peoples, um, including one about food plants of coastal first peoples. I've never met Dr. Turner, but I did take a workshop once from one of her grad students and uh, learned quite a bit about uh, native uses of plants. Let's go back to that. Okay, so, to, so those are a few, and there are many, many more people that know a lot about ethnobotany, including right in our area, Heidi Bowen, if some of you know her from the Central Puget Sound chapter, knows a lot about uh, material uses, weavings, and other other uh, plant uses by by local Native American people. So, in order to understand something about ethnobotany, you have to think a little bit about plant physiology, and plants produce primary chemicals, which if you know anything about chemistry, would be carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. But the important thing about these primary chemicals is that they are the chemicals the plant needs to survive. It's what the plant uses to grow and reproduce. So it needs carbohydrates for energy. It needs proteins to build different kinds of molecules and lipids maybe to make the wax on the outside of the leaf and so on. These are essential chemicals and without them, the plant could not exist. When we eat plants, we're basically eating these chemicals and, and getting our nutrients from the carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids that the plant produces. But plants also produce secondary chemicals. And secondary chemicals uh, are, they can, they can be classified in different, different ways chemically. And I'll go back and talk about these for just a second. But um, these are chemicals that protect plants from diseases and predators. So the plant doesn't need it to survive directly. It needs it indirectly to keep itself healthy. It's kind of like we have an immune system to help us fight off diseases. Plants don't have an immune system, but they have a way to produce these secondary chemicals. And um, secondary chemicals are uh, more similar in plants that are related to each other than they are in plants that are not related. So for instance, the mustard family, when you eat uh, cauliflower or broccoli or kale or cabbage, they all have a certain type of flavor to them that comes from um, glycosidic chemicals. And so glycosides are, are the uh, the, category there. And we like that because it tastes good, but the plant makes it because it protects it, the plant from maybe some kind of insect or other uh, disease damage. So we use these chemicals in some cases as spices, like the brassicas. Um, so alkaloids are secondary chemicals that can be much, much more toxic, although not always because for instance, caffeine is an alkaloid. So there's the stimulant in coffee. Um, another alkaloid is morphine coming from the opium poppy. 
uh, or opium itself. And uh, people have used those as relaxants, certainly in historically um, and today, but it's also used as medicines. Uh, phenols are compounds that are like alcohols, but more acidic. And so an example is acetaminophen, Tylenol is derived from a phenol. Vanillin, the flavor in vanilla is, is a phenol. Anthocyanins, which are the chemicals that make uh, red coloring in leaves. Uh, those, are, those are different kinds of phenols. And terpenes um, are a type of hydrocarbon that an example would be rubber. So the thing that very thing that uh, Richard Schultes was looking for in the Amazon was a terpene produced by a plant. Rosin that people um, that play bowed instruments use to keep their, their bows, give their bows a little friction against the string is another kind of terpene and various kinds of solvents that we get from plants. So secondary chemical, so primary chemicals are what we use for food from plants. Secondary chemicals are what we use for spices, medicines, stimulants, and relaxants and similar kinds of things. So by the way, let me just, just take a little digression here that if you have questions, I think Elizabeth said this, but please type them in the Q&A and I will, I'm trying to keep track of my time and, and at the end, I'll try to answer as many of the questions as I can. So the next little section of this talk is um, several examples of different kinds of plant, of uh, ethnobotanical uses of plants. And I'm gonna start with food. Food's always my favorite. And uh, trying to use examples that are not something that many of us in North America might be um, familiar with, I thought I'd, I'd start with teff. So um, if you live in Seattle, you're very lucky because you have a lot, or at least before the pandemic started, you have a lot of Ethiopian restaurants to partake of. And when I lived in Seattle, I loved Ethiopian food and I loved to go to Ethiopian restaurants. And if you find a very traditional Ethiopian restaurant or Eritrean, um, as you can see on the map here, what used to be Ethiopia is now divided into two countries, Eritrea on the north and Ethiopia is most of this area here. Um, uh, one of the, or the grain that is most um, associated with Ethiopian and Eritrean food is called teff. It's a grass. Its scientific name is Aragrossus teff. And I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. But uh, teff grows in um, kind of the mid-level mid altitude of the mountains of Ethiopia. And it's uh, where the soils are not especially loamy, they're more clay type soils. And it's small grain. Um, here's a picture of teff in the highlands of Ethiopia. And just looks like a grass, but the grains are smaller than wheat or some of the other grasses that we're more familiar with. And it turns out that these grains have pretty high nutrients, 80% starch, which is about normal for grain, 11% protein, very high for a grain. Most grains do not have protein that much. A um, little bit of fat, a lot of amino acids, especially lysine, which other grains don't have. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so high in fiber is because these grains are small, you can't separate the, you can't refine them by taking the outer husk off of the grain like they do with wheat and, and rice and some of the other grains that we eat more commonly. So it's always a whole grain product. And lots of minerals such as iron, calcium and potassium, especially iron almost no gluten. So it turns out that um, this grain grows really well in Idaho. 
uh, and many people who have immigrated to the United States from Ethiopia or Eritrea uh, purchase teff that comes from Idaho. And I found that in, in uh, some Ethiopian markets that I went to in Seattle. Uh, but it's, it's pretty healthy. It's not cheap to grow here because you can't bulk harvest it the way you can bulk harvest the wheat. It's just not the machinery doesn't work for this grain the way it's made to work for wheat. So it costs more here, but in Ethiopia, it doesn't really cost more because that's the way people have been doing it for centuries. And what you make out of teff, you make a bread, a flat bread called injera. And injera is an amazing um, substance, amazing food because First of all, it has a very tangy taste. It's it's um, it's it's got a uh, kind of baking soda uh, in it to rise, so it's a little bit acidic, like sourdough. And you make it in a pan, big like a crepe pan, and you make this huge, oh maybe one and a half foot across piece of injera, and it's the plate. You put it on top of a plate, and then you put all your other foods on top of it. And this plate might be shared, and then you have extra pieces of injera also. This plate might be shared by two people or four people or six people, depending on how big the injera is, how many people there are. And um, you don't need utensils because you just take a piece of injera and eat the various foods that are in the middle of the plate. Uh, it becomes a social uh, gathering focal point. And uh, if you haven't been to an Ethiopian restaurant, you should go. Wait till the pandemic's over when it's safe, but uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's an amazing experience and delicious food. All right, so that's an example of food. Here's an example that many people find dear to their heart. This is uh, spices and flavorings. And for my example, I thought I'd use chocolate. So the chocolate plant, or is a small tree um, and its scientific name is Theobroma cacao. It's in the Malvaceae, the mallow family. Um, this used to, the Malvaceae currently has um, consolidated two or three families that used to be separate. This family used to be the Sterculiaceae and now that's a subfamily within the, the mallow family, the Malvaceae. Um, Cacao is native to tropical Central and South America. And uh, take a look at this picture and notice these red bulbs that are hanging on the tree. Those are the chocolate fruits, the cacao, we always call it cacao um, fruits. These are the flowers here. Notice how they're growing. Here's a picture of the trunk of the tree. And these flowers grow right off the trunk. They don't always grow on a branch, although they can. We call that situation cauliflory. Call means stem and flory means flowers. So the flowers and fruits grow directly from the trunk of the tree. This is not a, a common thing, not a common situation in plants, but it, it does happen in other families and other kinds of plants, jackfruit, in the fig family or the uh, mulberry family, papaya in the papaya family. And in New Zealand, there are actually fuchsias, tree fuchsias that have um, coliflorous flowers. So that's kind of an interesting botanical thing about, about uh, cacao. Over on the right, you see a cacao fruit that has been split open and there are seeds in here, but the seeds are surrounded by this white pulp. The white pulp um, in the processing of making something chocolate, cho what they call chocolate liqueur, um, the pulp is removed during the fermentation of the cacao seeds, but the pulp itself contains sugars and often it is also fermented and made either into an alcoholic beverage or, or used in the process of of making whatever chocolate product is being made. A little bit of history of chocolate um, comes from Central and South America. So it was used and known to the Mayans, the Aztecs, 
and the Andean Indians. The Aztecs called this plant the gift of the gods and they made a beverage called chocolatl that was only allowed to be imbibed by nobles and priests. And interestingly enough, we're used to drinking hot chocolate or chocolate beverage that's sweet and we always add sugar to chocolate, but the Aztecs did not do that. Their beverage was not sweet. They added chili peppers and vanilla, so it was spicy. And again, it was only allowed for the noble people. But in 1528, the explorers from Spain came to um, meet the Aztecs and decided this was something worth bringing back to Spain. So they brought it back to Spain in 1528 and it really did not go over well. People were not that interested in drinking something that wasn't sweet. So sooner or later, the Spanish got a hold of some sugar and added that to the beverage and that made it quite popular in Europe. And by 1847, which notice is quite a few years after 1528, the first chocolate bar was produced by the Cadbury Company in Great Britain. And many people today can't live without it. Um, the secondary chemical that's in uh, Theobroma cacao is called theobromine. And so you may be familiar with the Theo chocolate um, factory in Seattle. They get their name from this chemical that's in chocolate, theobromine. This is an alkaloid and it's a derivative of caffeine, but it's much milder as far as the stimulant effect. Um, of course, I guess it's possible to eat enough chocolate that you uh, have the same stimulation as, as you would get from a cup of coffee, but it would take quite a bit. Um, darker chocolate has higher levels of theobromine. And as with all secondary chemicals, it's not gonna be the same from plant to plant or even from year to year. An interesting thing about theobromine is that it's toxic to animals that metabolize this chemical more slowly than humans do. So you've probably heard you shouldn't give your dog chocolate. But dogs and horses have a slower theobromine metabolism. They can't break it down and then it becomes toxic to them. And here you see a couple of famous chocolate products like Kahlua and chocolate covered coffee beans. I think that's what those are. Uh, so the fermented pulp makes that chocolate flavor. The beans um, are dried and roasted and you get this product called chocolate liquor, which is oily paste from the uh, crushed seed embryos. And when the dried seeds are ground up, we get cocoa powder. When we add milk and sugar, we can get chocolate candy and flavorings. Um, and then cocoa butter comes with the white chocolate that's used in, in uh, cosmetics and of course to eat as white chocolate. Okay, um, another important thing that I learned from teaching this class is about food and medicine. And uh, in the United States and in Western Europe in the Western world, we think of these as two very different things. Food is what's in your refrigerator, what you get at a restaurant, what you eat for you know, three times a day. Medicine is what comes in little orange bottles and you have to go purchase it separately and you only take it when you're sick. Well, that is not how much of the world views these two things. Um, in many cultures, especially many indigenous cultures that haven't been influenced by European American cultures, there's not much distinction between food and medicine. And I, um, I had a, a colleague, a woman that I worked with at, at Everett Community College who was Vietnamese. And she told me that her family used garlic as a, as a medicinal plant, but 
the way they used it was they put it in every single meal and the garlic kept them healthy. And she even told me that they gave it to her cat when the cat was sick. Um, but they, they really believe that if you keep eating garlic all the time, you have a healthier immune system and you don't get sick as often. So we think of garlic as a spice or a flavoring. Um, and you, some people eat it a lot, some people don't eat it that much, but we don't think of it as medicinal. And, and really in um, Southeast Asia, it's very medicinal. And I mean, it actually is if you test it uh, scientifically, garlic is an antimicrobial. It, it really kills bacteria. Ginger works in a similar way. Um, and again, garlic is probably found around the world now, but, but um, it's used in many cultures, certainly in Europe and in Asia. Um, ginger is more of a tropical plant, so you don't see as much in European cooking, but you certainly see it in in uh, Indian cooking and, and Southeast Asian cooking and Polynesian cooking and so on. I put a little um, reference as the Harborview Medical Center has a ethnomed website and there's a lot of fascinating information. It's not all of it is about ethnobotany, but um, you can find some pretty interesting information about how different cultures use different foods and medicines on that website. Um, I wanted to just mention this particular uh, plant. This is the neem tree, Azadaracta indica um, from the mahogany family. And this is I'm not sure if it's official yet, but it is kind of the national tree of India. This tree is the most important plant for many um, people in India, especially the more rural people, but you can see that there's that picture is taken in a, at least a town, if not a city. So um, the picture on the right is something that I bought at my local garden store last year. It's called neem oil. And um, you can find it in any garden store. <clears throat> and neem oil is, is a natural pesticide. So you can use, I bought it because I had some insects on potato leaves, potato plants in my yard. And I sprayed it on there a couple times and the insects died and the plants were healthy again. So the story of this plant is that it was known to um, Hindu speaking and Urdu speaking people for centuries. And people use neem branches to brush their teeth. They use uh, neem to put in with their clothing when it's stored to keep insects out of it. They use neem for uh, antioxidants and there's multiple, multiple uses for, um, for this neem plant. In the 1980s, somebody from your, uh, the Western world, I think it was England originally, discovered, quote, discovered that here was this great plant in India and everybody was just using it for free. And why don't we just take it to Europe or the United States and sell it? because you could make a lot of money on this, this plant. It's very um, efficient in, in doing the things, you know, keeping, getting rid of insects. It actually stop, interferes with the um, egg development process of the, in, of the insects. So eventually this, in 1988, the patent was sold to an American company called W.R. Grace. And Grace opened a manufacturing plant in India to make agricultural pesticides and other products in the 1990s. And um, people in India started thinking about this and said, wait a minute, whose plant is this? Who should make the profit from this particular um, group of products? And just because this company has a patent, that's something that nobody thought about in India because it was always just there, um, they should not, the profits should be coming back to Indian people and not to people in another country. <clears throat> and there was a whole um, 
outcry about biopiracy, which is a term you may not have heard, but biopiracy means taking a natural living species from a group of indigenous people in one part of the world, taking it to somewhere else and making money on it. So the amazing outcome of this story is that the government of India really started working on this and they um, developed a couple of things. One is the Neem Foundation, which was a foundation that, that evolved and still exists to protect the neem plant and make sure that any profits from neem stayed in India, but mostly that neem was free to people in India. And the other thing was the AYUSH, Ayush Research Portal, um, which is the Ayurvedic, I can't remember all, what all the letters stand for, but it has to do with Ayurvedic treatments and Ayurvedic knowledge and Ayurvedic knowledge has been with Indian people um, for centuries, but it was never written down. It was always oral tradition passed on. And because it was never written down, when somebody applied for a patent for a, a plant that people knew about for centuries, there is nothing in Western culture to say, oh, you can't have a patent because this was already known by these people, you know, and here's the evidence. So what they started doing was writing down all Ayurvedic treatments and Ayurvedic knowledge on an international website. And I just checked this today. This is, this is the current um, website and you can look up a lot of different things. It's not just about plants, but um, about the Ayurvedic knowledge. Uh, and there it is in English, not in Hindi or Urdu. Uh, so that if somebody does say, hey, I found this plant, grows in India, seems to work for these people, so I'm gonna patent it, it can't happen anymore, in, at least for India. Um, and there are other places around the world, um, such as Korea um, and the ginseng plant where the same principles apply. So intellectual property rights are an interesting concept that referred uh, that are related to ethnobotany. And, and I'll just briefly mention one other intellectual property right issue and that's uh, Taxol. Taxol is the um, treatment for ovarian cancer that was discovered in the Pacific U, Taxus brevifolia, a um, number of years ago. And now it's being made in a different way. It's not being taken from the trees anymore, but whose trees were those? Whose knowledge was that when um, people started to think about patenting that, that substance? Uh, we have another, <clears throat> or we have a, um, a great resource in Seattle and in Washington, and that is Bastyr University, the naturopathic university, where they don't just teach medicine, but they actually do some research. And one of the research um, studies in the early 2000s that was done at Bastyr University was to look at the efficacy of this particular plant, Echinacea purpurea, um, the purple cone flower, which is a native to Europe um, and very, it grows really well here. So it's, it's a popular plant in North America and Europe. There is a popular idea that this plant is effective in reducing inflammation and boosting the immune response. And there was a time in the 1980s and 90s when people were just taking echinacea to um, ward off colds and, and uh, other kinds of viruses. Um, but nobody had done any scientific testing. So in the early 2000s, Bastyr University sponsored a study um, they tested 400 children with, um, that had had urinary tract infections and um, they used a placebo on some and they used echinacea on others. It turned out to make a long story short that there was no 
um, no definitive difference between the, the effects of the echinacea and the effects on the, uh, of the placebo on the, student, on the uh, children. However, it was one study and there needs to be a lot more studies. Um, here's one, a lot of these studies are published at PubMed, um, which is, uh, I can't remember what NCBI stands for, National Can't, no, I don't wanna say that, <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, it's part of NIH, the National Institute of Health. Um, and you can look that up, but we're just beginning to see Sorry, we're just beginning to see scientific studies to find out if some of these plants that have been used by different people for a long time are, um, can be documented to have effects. Some of them are, and some of them are not. Um, echinacea, so far, they haven't come up with any definitive answers. On the other hand, this plant, the Beach Morning Glory, in the morning glory family, which is really commonly used in Polynesian, Southeast Asian, Chinese, and South American cultures to treat a variety of disorders. Uh, when it was studied scientifically, there, there was a, a definite um, difference between the subjects that got the um, beach morning glory and the subjects that got the placebo. Um, this plant was shown to inhibit tumor growth of melanoma tumors, and it was especially shown to be effective against uh, jellyfish dermatitis. So when you contact a jellyfish and get a skin rash from that. Um, and that's one of the things that had been used for in many cultures for a long time. And um, it's beginning to change now, but a lot of these medicinal uses of plants were, have never been studied in the United States. Um, I don't know if this has to do with the, uh, the cloud of the AMA or just in general, people trust uh, kind of Western science more than, more than uh, indigenous people's uses of plants. But a lot of the studies came from India or from Japan or from other cultures and other countries. And it's just now starting to come into the United States. Even Europe um, has done a lot more studies than, than uh, American studies. Um, one more example of that is ashwagandha, which is a plant in the potato family called Lithania somnifera. This plant has been used as a tonic and a medicine for 6,000 years in India and Pakistan and other uh, related countries. It's got all these different uh, effects on the body, anti-tumor, antioxidant, and so on. Um, and by the way, I never, I, it took me a long time to understand why one plant could do all these different things. Whereas when you want to take, get something for arthritis, there's a drug in this country that treats arthritis and only arthritis. Well, I think that the key is this word, anti-inflammatory. Um, inflammation is so much a part of so many disorders in throughout the body. And if you can cut inflammation, by herbal medicine or any other kind of medicine, you can actually treat many different kinds of disorders. So again, I put in a journal from, I mean, an article from the African Journal of Traditional Complementary and Alternative Medicines that's uh, published on PubMed also. Um, back to Richard Evans Schultes, the, one of the fathers of Ethnobotany went to the Amazon. He was looking for this plant. And at the time that he went in the 1940s or early 1940s, people knew that there was this um, drink that was used ceremonially and by many Amazon native peoples called ayahuasca, but they had no idea what, where that's come, where it came from and what plants were in it. it was a, a you know, whether it was a one plant or a mixture of a plant, plants. So um, 
Schultes and later his students, Wade Davis and Tim Plowman, were able to find that it was associated with this plant, a vine called Banisteriopsis capii um, in the Malfigiaceae. And uh, I have never taken, I've never seen this plant. So these are photos that I took from the internet, but uh, it's a vine that grows in the jungle um, throughout the Amazon and uh, people that speak Quechua and Quechua is not a native language in those areas. It's a native language for the people today, but it actually came from one tribe who went through the uh, Amazon area and conquered other tribes and left their language. So ayahuasca has an active compound called an, an alkaloid called DMT. I can't remember what those letters stand for, so you'll have to look it up. Um, it's a cathartic anemetic, makes you have diarrhea and vomit. Um, and if you've ever heard of anybody, and there are people from the United States and other places that go to the Amazon specifically to take part in ayahuasca ceremonies, um, they have a lot of those issues. It, um, the the uh, uh, Banisteriopsis is usually mixed with Psychotria viridis, also called Chacruna, or other psychoactive plants. And together the mixture becomes an MAO inhibitor. MAO is monoamine oxidase. And this is an enzyme that activates some neurotransmitters in our brains. So if you're genetically low in certain neurotransmitters, MAO inhibitors help regain normal function. But ayahuasca is a, is a way that, um, well, I'm sorry, not but, but ayahuasca is a way that you can treat uh, disorders possibly, such as addiction and anxiety and certain kinds of depression and PTSD. Um, when people uh, attend an ayahuasca ceremony, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, um, they often have hallucinations, they often, um, have a very uh, cathartic experience. And at the end of the number of hours that that happens, uh, they feel like they've had visions and, and uh, other renewal in their body. And I actually had a colleague who participated in this. Um, there's the, the hallucinations or visions. Um, and when I was in Ecuador, I did go to a, a ceremony that was put on for tourists. So it wasn't exactly the real thing, but we did meet some shamans who showed us uh, how to, showed us what the ceremony would look like. So uh, there is a way that they make the tea um, with the leaves of the Banisteriopsis and the other plants that are added to it. And these are actually uh, two shamans that uh, would, would be involved in a ceremony. Uh, and what the little ceremony that I went to, they said, well, is anybody here sick or does anybody want treatment for um, some kind of evil spirit that's in your body or some kind of illness that's in your body? And then they focus their, their uh, ceremony towards that person. And the ceremonies can vary. They often include tobacco use as well as ayahuasca use. And uh, the, the curanderos or the shamans that drink the ayahuasca on a more frequent basis, they don't really get affected by it as much as somebody who's never had it before and goes and, and imbibes. Okay, I'm gonna to try to finish up pretty soon here, but I wanted to give you a couple more uh, interesting examples. So uh, I live in a town called Port Townsend and we happen to have a number of very skilled artisans in Port Townsend that make violin bows. And these, these guys are like world renowned and people that play violin that are really good violinists 
often order these bows for thousands and thousands of dollars. So uh, at the Port Townsend Film Festival last year, there was a film about the, it's called The Bow Makers, I'll show you the slide in a minute, um, about how these bows are made. And what struck me when I saw this film was it's ethnobotany. Um, there is a tree that grows in Brazil called Pau Brasilia echinata. Um, it's in the legume family. And uh, they show in the film, I'll show you that picture here. Um, uh, you can see the, the bowmakersfilm.com. You can look at that. Um, that there are a couple of kinds of wood that when people buy a violin, an expensive violin bow, they either get this um, um, Pernambuco or Brazil wood. Well, they actually both come from the same tree. One of them is a darker color because the wood is, uh, the rings of the wood are in the heartwood and the other one is a lighter color because it's in the sapwood. And I think I got those reversed. Anyway, the colors are different because one is heartwood and one is sapwood. And uh, you have to get it from Brazil. It's the only place it grows. And this is an extremely prized uh, plant. So if you get a chance to see that film, you can see the whole story of people going to Brazil and these expert bow makers in Port Townsend making violin bows from it. Um, I also found this really interesting little article um, from a violin maker in St. Paul, Minnesota about Pernambuco or Brazil wood and what the differences are. Uh, one more, more thing to, or a couple more things to talk about. One is that plants don't stay in one place. Even though they don't have legs, they hitch rides with all kinds of animals and especially with human animals. Um, so we know one of the ways we can study human migrations is by looking at plant migrations. And a great example of, is going back to Hawaii again, uh, coconuts. They came on the canoes with the original people that settled in Hawaii. Uh, these are the, that's a picture of the type of boat. This is actually, I took this picture in Hawaii, somebody that was making a replica of a canoe, a large canoe that might've been, um, might've traveled from another Polynesian island to Hawaii. And I wanna talk about this plant here. This is a sweet potato. We don't think much about sweet potatoes, but I was, before I really studied this, I had traveled, I'd been in Hawaii and I knew that there were sweet potatoes there. And I went to New Zealand in 2003. And lo and behold, the native people in New Zealand, the Maori people ate sweet potatoes all the time. And there was a native name for the sweet potato. And I thought, I thought sweet potatoes came from South America. How did they get to New Zealand? And why are they so important for the native people? Well, if you do a little um, name research, you find that in South America, a uh, sweet potato might be called Kumara or Kumar or Koala, depending on which part of South America you're in. Go to Polynesia and Kumara, the same name, they spelled the K instead of the C, same name as in Peru, is in Easter Island, in Tuamotu, in Rarotonga. Um, and then as you go down the list and look at some of these other names, they're all related. And these are all the Polynesian islands down to New Zealand where it's called Kumara again. Um, so that similarity of names in all these different languages tells us that this plant was carried by people from one place to another. And if we go back to our map here, it came from South America. Somebody traveled long before the Europeans had big boats and, and brought it up into the, or I'm sorry, this way, up into the South Pacific um, Island group and New Zealand's over here. So that means, you know, they had to go a little bit further west to get to New Zealand. Uh, 
these were things that I was very privileged to see when I was in New Zealand. I saw uh, a demonstration at a cultural center of how you get fibers out of the New Zealand flax plant. I have New Zealand flax in my backyard right here in Port Townsend. I haven't tried making uh, extracting fibers from it, but but I, I know there's a way. Um, in Ecuador, I was able to stay for a week at this um, field school for, for medical students from the University of Arizona. And this man, Scott, um, no, Todd, I'm sorry, um, grew up in Ecuador because his parents owned some kind of a state there. And he, and they were Americans, and he went back to teach in Arizona, but he also owned this big tract of land that he turned into a field school and he speaks Quechua, the language that is common among the native peoples in the Amazon. And this woman, we met her. Um, I don't know how old she was at the time. This was in 2008. Um, I would say in her 70s. She did not speak Spanish and she did not speak English. The only way you could speak to her was in Quechua, which of course I couldn't speak, but she had an amazing knowledge of plants. And so Todd here was recording everything she had to say in Quechua about the plants around them. And then he would go back and, and uh, transcribe that into English. So I guess one of the ending points here is that Conserving ecosystems and cultural systems are integral to each other. You can't, an indigenous people can't maintain their culture unless they have the ecosystem that they lived in for generations. Uh, and at the same time, we also have to conserve not, not only the ecosystem, but the varieties of the crops and the plants that people grow. And in this market in Ecuador, you see all kinds of potatoes. And here you see some corn from Mexico. It doesn't look anything like what we see in our markets here because these are what we call the centers of diversity of these plants. And we're losing those, the diversity of varieties of these different crop plants. Um, and I encourage you to go uh, look, look up this man, Nikolai Vavilov, who was a Russian geneticist who worked on crop diversity in the 1930s. And there's an amazing story of him um, trying to save his seed institute in uh, St. Petersburg during the siege uh, during World War II. And he and many of his staff died, but the seeds were saved and the Seed Institute is still there. And a, a great book about this is written by a local, um, not local, but American um, ethnobotanist named Gary Paul Nabin. Um, you may have heard of him. He worked in Arizona for a long time. I think he's still there. He wrote a book called Where Our Food Comes From, Retracing Nikolai Vavlov's Quest to End Famine. Um, highly recommend that book. And we'll end with uh, Maria, who was a Ecuadorian midwife and shaman, and Jen, who is a American MD, who spent a summer together in this field camp in Ecuador and realized that each had many contributions to make to the well being of the people around them. And my last slide here, I just wanted to put in because that anthropology teacher that, uh, that uh, really prompted me and made sure that I taught this class, Cynthia Clark passed away this just a couple months ago. And uh, I was very sad to hear that, um, but uh, she was a big, she pushed me in a lot of ways that I wasn't always happy about, but in the end, I think, that uh, she was a great colleague to have. All right, so I'm going to stop talking for this moment and take a look at your questions. Let's see. Here we are.
So if you have questions, put them in your Q&A. And I see that there are six questions right now, and I will do my best to answer them. Put on the other glasses. OK. Michael says, are there any Black, Indigenous, or people of color who are ethnobotanists to make the highlight real? If not, why not? There certainly are Indigenous ethnobotanists, I know, in Hawaii. Um, and I mean, in some ways, the more, um, uh, what do I want to say, the less contact there is with with the Europeans, the less need there are for anybody to specialize in ethnobotany because everybody's an ethnobotanist. I unfortunately don't know of any black ethnobotanists, but I certainly don't know all ethnobotanists. So that would that is something that I want to find out about. Um, I know that there are uh, people in Native American people. In, even in, in the Seattle area who are very interested in ethnobotany. Now, you know, what makes you an ethnobotanist? Do you have to have a PhD or could you just be really interested in plants? In my opinion, being really interested in, in plants and people is enough to make you an ethnobotanist. So questions like that make us want to learn more and want to find out more and want to talk to more people. And that's what I'll do. So thanks for asking that. Uh, Teddy says, for secondary chemicals, is it only by acidity and that sort of properties or it is a lot more complex? Um, it's really, whether something's a secondary or primary chemical is more about its function than about its chemistry, if that makes sense. So um, starch is a chemical that plants produce, it's a hydrocarbon. And the function of starch is to store energy and the plants make it so that they can, you know, store energy in their roots for leafing out next spring or whatever. Um, and then we eat those starchy products of the plants and we get energy from that same starch. So it's not really about what the, what the chemical structure is, except that the chemical structure allows that particular chemical to store energy. I don't know if that makes sense, but, but those terms come from function more so than from chemical structure. I hope I'm, if I'm not making these clear, just type in something else and I'll get back to it eventually here. Teddy says, for the grass, are the root systems sturdier and stronger since they grow in clay? Oh, for Teff? I don't know that. Um, grasses in general have very fibrous roots, and I don't know anything about the roots of Teff. So good question. I don't have an answer. Uh, Ruth said, doesn't garlic have to be raw? I think that raw garlic has is stronger as far as its chemical properties, but you can still have a lot of um, benefit from cooked garlic too, as far as I know. These are, these are maybe beyond my expertise. Uh, ah, good, an expert on India says, Neem is not a national tree of India. Of course, etymology, uh, oh, the word, uh, as, as Adiracta is means dark hat. Mughals from Persia called the tree freely concurring in mainland India. I'm not sure what you're saying that, that the word came from Persia. No, it says it comes from Hindu. Um, I read something on that Neem Foundation site. I think I think what it said was they would like to make it the, oh, it says, here it is. It says granting Neem the status of national tree would send out the right signals to the world. This one move 
will help convert a national resource into a national asset. So yet you're right, it's not the national tree, but at least the Neem Foundation would like to make it the national tree. So thank you for that information. Uh, another person says, I'm very curious, where did you purchase that neem oil? My answer is Henry's Hardware in Port Townsend. Neem oil is not registered with a PCP in Canada, so legally can't be sold as an insecticide in Canada. Well, I guess it can in the United States because uh, I just got it last year or you know, within the last year. I don't, I don't know um, how that works with patents. I think that the earlier, the patents before the 1980s are still in effect um, and any new patents can't be taken out. Julie says, which plant or plants do you think has had the greatest impact on human culture? Well, that's a setup question. Um, <laughs> I guess I would have to say grains because they are the, by far the most important, not just one grain, but all grains, most important food crop, but you know, you could argue with that. Uh, Linda says, King County Master Gardeners has an ethnobotany demonstration class, a garden, tribal life trail at Lake Wilderness Arboretum in Mount Maple Valley. It's organized into zones for medicinal, culinary, utilitarian, ceremonial, and clothing purposes. And I will add to that that part of the reason that trail exists is they got a grant from the Native Plant Society um, Education Committee, I believe. I'm pretty sure that's that we gave a grant to that one. So thank you WNPS and thank you King County Master Gardeners. And there are ethnobotanical gardens in a lot of places. They're not always kept up, but I know um, being on the education committee for a long time, we gave a number of grants. Um, there's a little one at the, um, um, the Mountaineers building in Seattle. There's one down in Olympia at, at the Capitol um, and a number of others. Could you provide a concise but authoritative definition of the field? Are botany and ethnographic study always balanced in the field? Do scholars divide their work between categories like your subheadings or ideally combine all aspects? Um, I guess I'm not really enough of an expert to answer that question, but I would say anything that combines uh, anthropology or the study of human culture with how anthropologists or how people use plants is ethnobotany and how they interact with plants and animals might be ethnobiology. There are some universities that have um, departments of ethnobotany or ethnobiology, especially the University of Hawaii has a really important program. Um, there is a professor named Daniel Moorman, M-O-E-R-M-A-N-N. -N. I think he is at, in Michigan. And I just looked up, I know he had a really good website for a long time of uh, Native American uses of plants. And I looked at it today and it's down, which makes me think that he might've retired. Um, so I think, there is no one answer. I think everybody interprets this field in a different way and it depends on where you study and what your approach is and what your interest is. And some people limit it to studying a certain group of people. Some people limited to only medicinal like the Bastyr University has a ethnobotany program that's only about um, the medicinal uses of plants and other places. Um, you know, specialize in other things. Dr. Sass says, please tell me about some species of ethno-veterinary importance in terms of pandemic to wild or domestic animals. I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. Um, I, I just, sorry, I, I'm not, I don't even know where to refer you to, but I will look and see if I can find anything. So I apologize, not able to answer that question. 
Uh, Lori no Nord says, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous wis Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teaching of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I've been trying to get that book for a long time, I will say. I've heard about this book and, and uh, yes, I recommend it from hearsay. I haven't read it yet. Um, this is a uh, native Potawatomi um, writer. Okay, Gail, Gail Patterson, I took your biology class at Everett. Oh yes. And went on to get my undergrad and grad degree from Bastyr. I would like to know, is there any policies in place to help with the prevention of destroying the land while harvesting these medicinal plants? Um, I think it depends on the area and the country. Uh, India is definitely trying to prevent it, but it's not always preventable in other places and, it, and the land is not always destroyed. Um, sometimes people make a collection, but they're not out to destroy every single plant of the species. So I think it's just not that black and white. Um, Aaron Pierce, what is the significance of cedar for indigenous cultures in the Pacific Northwest? Well, it's because I had to cut my time down. Um, it is, and I am probably not the person to speak to this as much as some other people that know a lot more than me, but I understand that Western red cedar is a spiritually important tree. It, it is a strengthening tree. It's a tree that people look to as a, an important being. And of course they get many materials from the cedar tree. So canoes are made from cedar. The cedar bark is used for clothing and for baskets and things like that. So it has a lot of uses, but it's also, there's something about that large long lived tree that gives it very spiritual properties. Would you recommend any certain Washington college for more in-depth education on ethnobotany? Um, I don't know at this point, uh, especially with the pandemic and people changing all their classes to um, online. Uh, there was a, an anthropology professor at UW named Eugene Hun, who was more of a, a bird expert than a plant expert, but he was an amazing guy. I mean, he still is an amazing guy, but I don't know that he's actually teaching anymore. Um, I'm not sure if Everett Community College is gonna teach that class when they get back to in-person classes. Um, and maybe somebody else in the group knows of, of a program that's ongoing. So if you do just type something in. Marianne says, just looked in the book, Fiber Fueled about garlic's medicinal effects when chopped an enzyme called alanase is activated. It's allease, I think, is activated and converts allein to allicin. Takes about 10 minutes for the enzyme to make the allicin, a compound that has antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasitic, and even antiviral properties. Thank you. Uh, Linda Shepard said amazon.com sells neem oil, so you can get it there. Uh, and she also says tree, cedar tree of life to Northwest coast Indians by Hillary Stewart is a, a source for the cedar tree. Also Heidi Bowen, D-O-H-A-N, who's a local ethnobotanist, wrote a book called The Peoples of Cascadia. I think that's the name of her book that has some information about cedar tree. All right, I think I'm talked out. So actually, Fela, there were a few questions um, in the chat area, plus some good book recommendations. Um, we can go through real quick. I'm looking um, at it. In the chat. Yeah. Um, I see one of the book recommendations I can endorse. A couple of people recommended a book called The Cooking Gene, A Journey Through African-American Culinary History in the Old South oh, cool. by Michael W. Twitty. Great. And I've read this book. It's amazing He because he weaves in his own research into his genetic and documented 
ancestry and where in Africa his ancestors came from. Mm -hmm. So um, let me give that a thumbs up. Yeah. Um, there's some good thank yous. I also wrote down a couple of, so people got interested in Ethiopian restaurants. Um, Max Manchasa said one advantage of Ethiopian food is that there's no gluten in taff. And then um, Samantha Warner asked for some recommendations and Marianne Wiley said that Ethiopian restaurants are now doing takeout um, yeah. and recommended Delish off Rainier Avenue South in Columbia City, mm -hmm. saying that their combo plate offers a greater number of samples than some. Oh, yeah. So that's on my list. Um, Melissa Duffy, when you were talking about the Brazilian wood. Uh, yeah, I see that. From, from Buco. Yeah. That she she's actually grown one from a sprouted yarn, if I understand her right. And um, it creates a red dye. A, a girl plant from a sprouting yam. Oh, yam. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, right. Yes, that's true. Um, and somebody said, what part of the neem tree is used? As far as I know, every part of the neem tree. It's, it's a pretty amazing plant. Look, you can find little videos about neem. Um, there's a guy from Canada named David Suzuki. You may have heard of him. He used to do TV programs as a naturalist. And there's an old video of him talking about neem that I haven't looked lately, but it was on YouTube for a long time. That is worth, it's just like a five minute video. Um, great little thing about neem. And there's the cooking gene. Uh, can you tell me where I can send a donation, please? Elizabeth, would you like to take I, the question? Yeah, I'll be happy to. You can, if you go to our website, uh, wnps.org, there's a donate button, I believe, right on the home page. Or you can call me at 206-527-3210, and I can walk you through making a donation on the website or give you information if you'd like to mail in a check. And I, that's a wonderful, heartwarming question. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, also, I wanted to read this one that uh, apparently Nancy Turner has just edited a new book called Plants, People, and Places, The Roles of Ethnobotany and Ethnoecology in Indigenous Peoples, Land Rights in Canada and Beyond. So that's a book I'm gonna get. That sounds really interesting. Um, and another one is Iwagara, a book by a Raramuri author. So that's Polynesian. Uh, and I'll look for that too. There's another uh, book related comment from Marianne Wiley. Somebody had asked earlier about whether garlic needs to be raw to be effective. And she found in a book called Fiber Fueled that when chopped, an enzyme called alanase is activated and convert, converts allein to allicin, um, which takes about 10 minutes. And this latter compound, allicin, has antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasitic, and even antiviral properties. And mm -hmm. according to this book, it remains through cooking. So bring on the spaghetti. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, there's one more. Oh, somebody asked about Abe Lloyd. So I think Abe Lloyd lives in Bellingham, if I'm not mistaken. And somebody says, does he teach ethnobotany at WWU? I don't know. Does anybody know that answer? A couple of people. I do not know, but he has an insight. Yeah. And I think if you Google T Abe Lloyd, T first initial Abe Lloyd, um, you might be led to his website. I'm sorry, I can't remember what it is right now. So I just wanna say, I don't know you, Dr. Biswas, but I'm really appreciative that you were here and made some comments and I can't tell if you're actually 
in India or in the United States at this moment, but um, uh, it sounds like you know a lot and, and uh, you've suggested that I go to uh, somewhere in India, which I would love to do. <laughs> I just lost the, email, the chat that said that. Okay, I think we've got I think we've questions. pretty much got everybody. There's some thank yous and applause. Um, yeah, and by the way, if anybody would like to contact me separately, you can contact me at olympic at wnps.org. Is that right? I think that's right. O olympic, O-L-Y-M-P-I-C, at wnps.org. Okay, thank you so much, Fela. This was fascinating. And there's a lot of uh, reading that we'll, that we can all do starting now to find out more about this fascinating topic. Um, thank you, Janka. Thank you, that was fascinating. Okay, all right. Well, um, thanks for inviting me and uh, People have probably had enough of Zoom by now. <laughs>